you have some options. You have a screen in front of you that will have the text on it, and you have a bulletin that will have the words in it. But if you happen to have your Bible with you, a good old-fashioned uh, paper-paged Bible, I would encourage you to open it, because we're going to play a little bit of what they call Baptist bingo, and hop around a little bit and look at some other verses too, and I couldn't really put them all up on the, on the screen. Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to be reading for us. Uh, ah, here we go, beginning with verse 13. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, we thank You again and again and again for its truth and its beauty. And Father, we pray that You would bless it to us as it's read. Lord, help us to remember that the Bible is not some mere human book. It is the very Word of God, inspired by Your Spirit, given to us by prophets and apostles alike. And it is utterly distinct. There is no other book like it. It is without equal. It is one of a kind. Lord, help us as we hear Your Word read to be mindful of the great blessed privilege it is. And Father, we pray that the preaching that follows, in as much as it is faithful to what You have said about Yourself and our salvation, Lord, we pray that to that extent it would be helpful and memorable. And Lord, we even pray that You would lend power from on high to make it persuasive for us, beginning with me, extending to all who listen or watch. Father, we pray these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse 13, the Word of God. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. This ends the reading of God's Word. Well, have you ever had the feeling that you've bitten off more than you can chew? Just think a week or two ago to Thanksgiving. I'm sure some of you did. Just that very thing. I wanted to for my last Advent here, ministering to you, I've always tried to come up with a different way of looking at the birth of our Savior for us. And over the years we've done things like the women in the Messiah's life and looked at the ladies in the genealogies. We've looked at uh, Christmas in the book of Ruth, Christmas in Isaiah. We've looked at the Gospel of Luke. We've, looked, we've done 15 different things. And here we are the 16th. And I was thinking, what are we going to do? And I thought, we're going to try to do something that I think I ought to know better than to attempt. <laughs> Have you ever wondered why there are four Gospels? Why not just one? I used to wonder that. And that's a question that is not without many precedents in church history. The first person that we know of that asks that question, why are there four Gospels, is Irenaeus an early church father from the 2nd century. That's the 100s A.D., for those of you who have been out of English or history class for a while. And Irenaeus suggests that it's because there are these different facets or aspects to the life and ministry of the Messiah. And he goes back to the prophecy of Ezekiel when he describes the creatures before the throne of God, one of which has a face of a man, and the other side is the face of a lion, and the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. And so there became a tradition, and I talk about this a little bit in the pastor's note you'll get in the CITC newsletter that will be coming out uh, on the... Tuesday. On Tuesday, and that's because of... Uh, I'm the gum in the works there, not Connie, just so you know where to attribute the... If anything goes well here, give the credit to Connie. If it goes a little sideways, you know who to talk to, this guy. But in any event, 
Many early church fathers would look at the four Gospels, and we have a long tradition all the way past Augustine, where they say, okay, which one of the Gospels is an ox? Which, is a, which one shows him as the humble servant, the ox? Which one shows him as the king, the lion? Which one shows him as the prophetic voice, the preacher, the man? Which one shows him as the tr transcendent, uh, spirit-filled uh, eagle? I'm not sure those are the right ways to go about looking at the distinctives of the Gospels. I don't think we need to agree on which one is an ox or a lion or a man or an eagle, because certainly better theologians than I will ever be have not agreed on that. But the fact that lies at the heart of the question and is implicit in all of those answers is that the Gospels are, at the end of the day, different in their points of emphases regarding our Messiah. And so this Advent, you're thinking to yourself, so what has Pastor crammed into his mouth that he can't properly chew? We are going to look at the distinctive themes or notes in the four, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to do that by looking at what is first said about the Messiah in each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what is uniquely said in each of the Gospels about the coming of the Messiah in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I don't need to tell you, or at least don't need to tell many of you, that the Gospels are all different in how they introduce us to the notion of the Messiah. The Gospel of Mark has no account at all of the birth or the childhood of the Messiah. Matthew gives us a lot of information about the boyhood of the Messiah, but if you take your Bible, if you have your paper copy out, and you look at it, the actual birth of Christ occurs somewhere in the middle of the two halves of Matthew chapter 1, verse 25. Joseph knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And we fast forward two years. Luke gives us by far the most elaborate, detailed account of what happens on the night of his birth. And John presents this vision of the cosmic eternal Christ, God made flesh, the light of all men. They're all different in what they have to say because they all want us to understand something particular about the Lord who came to save us and the God and King whom we serve. And in Matthew's Gospel... The first thing that we see about Matthew is Matthew's introduction of Christ, the Messiah, is the genealogy. So let's take a look at that. Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to read this for you. Just follow along. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David, catch your breath here, <laughs> was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, Jotham the father, father of Ahaz, Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon. Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliad. And Eliad the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathen, and Mathen the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So, all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. 
and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Now that's the kind of text that we often look at and say, awesome. <laughs> what does chapter 2 have to say? Because there's not a lot there for me. But I want you to think about what Matthew is doing. First, what is he not doing? He's not doing what Luke does and starting his genealogy with Adam. He's starting with Abram. Furthermore, he's dividing this genealogy into three parts. From Abram, the founder of the nation, to David, from David to Jeconiah, or the Babylonian captivity, and from the Babylonian captivity to the coming of Christ. He's dividing it up into three areas. <coughs> the era of the development of the nation, the era of the nation under the Davidic kingship and its glory, and then the nation after it is reestablished in the second temple period. And each of those are stylistically broken up into 14 generations. And we know that the writer of Matthew here is referring back to the chronologies listed in First Chronicles. And he's in the second section of the Davidic kingship. He's leaving three out to make it 14. Now, when we think about genealogies, we tend to think about 23 and me. We tend to think about sort of a, a very precise, very specific, uh, fill in all the blanks of who is whose dad and granddad, and who is the second uh, cousin once removed, and all the rest in our family trees. They didn't think of genealogies that way in the ancient world. And even in the genealogies in the book of Genesis, we see that they're stylistic and thematic in nature. And this is nothing new to ancient study of history and other ancient Near Eastern cultures. The point is that Matthew, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is trying to show us a period of 14 generations, a period of 14 generations, and a period of 14 generations. For this reason, the number seven is the notion of the sacred number in the way the Hebrew mind thought about numbers, and numbers meant something. The number three was the divine number. The number seven was the sacred number, the complete number, the whole number. Uh, there were seven days in the week. And 14 is double that. So you have, in a sense, a period of two weeks, a period of two weeks, and a period of two weeks. Now do the math. And remember, the Hebrew mind, especially when it deals with apocryphal or eschatological issues, issues concerning the end times or spiritual history, is replete with asking you to do math. A time, times, and a half time. A time, one times, two more, and a half time, three and a half. Two plus two plus two is six. Not quite perfect, but the seventh, Jesus is born, who descends from him. And so there is a tradition that has been alive and well in interpreting what Matthew is doing in presenting Christ through this genealogy that begins with Abram, in which we look at this text and say, Matthew wants us to understand right out of the gate that Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of every single thing his people were supposed to be. That Jesus is, in fact, as the text that is utterly unique in all the accounts of the early life of Christ, he is the son brought up out of Egypt. So if you're keeping track of the time, the actual sermon starts now. <laughs> Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 tells us about something that happens in the middle of in the middle of chapter 2. Jesus is born at the very end of chapter 1. Okay? We're told that Joseph didn't know Mary. He didn't have any physical intimacy with her until the baby was born. And after the baby was born, we read in verse 25 of chapter 1 that he calls his name Jesus. Then we have three narratives. Jesus being visited by the wise men in Bethlehem. Then we have Jesus fleeing to Egypt. Then we have Jesus returning to the land. Now, the key to understanding all of what Matthew chapter 2 is trying to teach us in the biggest picture possible is in that verse 15. 
This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. If you have your Bibles, flip back with me to Hosea chapter 11. <coughs> I love that sound, pages turning. Mm -hmm. Hosea chapter 11 deals with two great images. One image is comparing the people of God to a bride. And another is comparing the people of God to a child. And that's the theme we have in chapter 11, although it comes up throughout the course of Hosea's ministry as well. Look at verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. Ephraim being a name for the northern tribes, for Israel, for the people of God as a whole. But they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness and with bands of love. And I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. I bent down to them and fed them. So here's a picture in which God is saying to his people through Hosea the prophet many, many years before Christ. He's saying, think of yourself, my people collectively, as a child. You were born in the Levant, the land of Canaan, flowing with milk and honey. And then in your boyhood, you were in Egypt. And out of Egypt I called you. I tried so hard to teach you to walk with me faithfully, obediently, but as often as I called you through Moses and Aaron, you rebelled and you went herring off after other gods. First it was just Baal, then it became a shear, then it became anything else. Throughout the history of God's people, God's people have demonstrated a stubborn, willful refusal to be the son that he called them to be. Because they couldn't. They were frail, they were sinful. They were false, they were full of fear. But not Jesus. And you see, one of the points, if we look at what is first said about the Messiah in the Gospel of Matthew and what is uniquely said about Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, we are given this picture that Jesus is the one who perfectly fulfills every stage of what his people were to have been over the course of their entire history. Everything about him is utterly perfect. And he has experienced all of the ups and downs that his people experienced. He knew what it was like to be a child in the land of promise. He knew what it was like to be a stranger in the land of a foreign power, desperate to preserve his life. He knew what it was like to be returned to the land, but yet not absolutely in control of his own destiny. Think about the history of Israel. Israel is founded by God's saving act in calling Abram out of Ur of the Chaldeans and establishing him, telling him he'd become a great nation, a father of nations. And he has one son who has two sons, who has twelve sons, who then go into Egypt and become a mighty host, hundreds of thousands, who then in their millions come and settle in Canaan. And then they sin and are carried off into captivity in Babylon. First Assyria, then Babylon. And then when they return to the land, much like when Jesus as a boy returns to the land, they're not really in control, are they? All of the intertestamental literature tells us about how they're barely keeping their heads above water. And even during the Hasmonean period, in the time of the Maccabees, they are always under the heel, even if it's a very gentle heel 
of the Neo-Babylonians or the Persians or the Greeks or the Romans. And Jesus lived, as it were, every one of those parts of his life perfectly. He utterly fulfilled the calling of the Son of God, the child of God, the boy who was raised. And there's something about that that makes it, for me, a lot easier to relate to him as my king. When you think about your life, you think about the ups and the downs, the good and the bad, the happy and the sad. And sometimes you feel that no one can ab absolutely relate to you because they've not been through everything you've been through and haven't been all the places you've been. And one of the points that Matthew is making about the Messiah is that he has lived, in a sense, every part of the experience of God's people. And this is a theme that comes out differently and certainly more clearly in the book of Hebrews, that he had to be made like us in every way. Not only did he had to be in order that he could stand in our place, but he was privileged to do that, that we might have a high priest who could sympathize with us in our weaknesses. And Jesus knows what it's like to be a brand new child of God in the early stages of your discipleship. Jesus knows what it's like to be going through the trials and temptations of a stay in Egypt. Jesus knows what it's like to be living on this side of heaven as a mature, seasoned Christian who understands that they are not of this world, but their true home is yet to come. And He is the true Son of God in whom all of us find our perfect representative <laughs> The great theme, well, two great themes that come through in Matthew's Gospel with crystalline clarity. One, Matthew, the Gospel writer, has a special emphasis on what Jesus said. He's the one who gives us the long version of the Sermon on the Mount. He focuses on Jesus' teaching ministry. And he also focuses on Jesus, the King, who rightly responds to every prophecy from the Old Testament. And I want you to think about how as we celebrate Advent, it's important for us to think in terms of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus Christ is the perfect King who has come to speak into our life knowing exactly what every stage of it has involved. And He Himself responded correctly every step of the way. <coughs> Nearly every one of you know that if you cut me deep enough, one of the things I believe is lacrosse. I love that game. It's a big part of my... Some pastors have fishing, some have golf. I have lacrosse. And as a lacrosse coach, it is so helpful to be able to say to kids, I know what that moment on the field is like, and I also know exactly what you should do in that situation. Isn't that what you want your coach to be able to say? I know what it's like, and I know what to do. And one of the things that the Bible seeks to impress upon on the, on the hearts and minds of Christians in every age is that, look, whatever you're going through right now, Jesus knows what it's like, and He knows what to do. And therefore, that kingly teacher who speaks into your world is worth listening to. Because there were 14 generations between Abram and David, and 14 generations between David and Babylon, and 14 generations between Babylon to Jesus. And Jesus is the true Son who knows what it's like to live all of those weeks and who himself inaugurates that one seventh great week in which we live with the true king, with the voice that cuts right to the heart of our every experience, our every doubt, our every fear, our every need. We think too little of Jesus, dear friends. 
we think too little of what He did when He took on flesh for us. When He embraced all of the captivity, the limitation, the fear, the frustration, all of our infirmities, as Isaiah 53 puts it, He did that for you that He might, with authority and experience, speak as your King into your life. So on His first Sunday of Advent, a Sunday we often associate with hope, I want to tell you that I could scarcely think of anything more hopeful to say to you this morning than this. Matthew wants you to understand with crystalline clarity that your Jesus has perfectly fulfilled and flawlessly executed the performance of every single aspect of the most difficult life you can imagine. Every chapter, phase, wrinkle, whatever. And He has drawn close to you in Advent. He says, and this then is how you should live. What hope that you have such a King who knows you so thoroughly and has lived your experience so completely, who hasn't failed in any of the places that I have failed over and over and over again, but that you have failed over and over and over again. And what a thought that He is that perfect Son in whom I have my standing. I want to close with a scene from Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 1, read, read a, a scene that, you know, I'm not often accused of being a too charismatic or a, a emotional guy. I, I wish I was more so. But that was back in my musician days. Uh, there is this picture in Hebrews chapter 1 where we're sort of given a scene in heaven itself. And the writer to Hebrews says, To which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. All of this with reference to Jesus. Of the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of our brightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And it is this very divine God who says that I am not ashamed to call people like you and me his brothers. You see, the Messiah, the true Son of God, who lived every chapter of God's life, of, of God's people's lives perfectly, never sinning. He invites you to come to Him and by virtue of your faith and, re and repentance being united to Him, you, in a sense, are His brethren and adopted into the family of God. Why? Because of Christmas. And so, dear Christian, have hope. I know some of your situations, some of them are tough. But guess what? Jesus knows. And never you fear. His Word is a sufficient guide to navigate you through the most difficult, tortuous mazes and chasms of life. Some of you are doing really well right now. To be a great hope. God's Word has wonderful words in it about how to best make use of the mountaintop experiences of living on this side of heaven. Some of you are on the uphill slopes or the downhill slopes. Have hope. Your King knows what both the ascent and the descent look like. And He tells you how to live. Only receive Him as your true King. The true Son. The One who shows you everything about how you can and should and may by His grace live your life today. Matthew's Gospel. The King who's been there and done that and invites you to follow Him. Amen? Amen. Almighty God, we ask that You bless us. Father, remind us that Jesus Christ didn't come down and uh, 
Lord, out of a crystal cathedral somewhere up in heaven and just instantly take our place. But Lord, rather, He first He walked our path. He walked our road. He carried our burdens. He cried our tears. He laughed at our jokes. He got our flus and our infirmities. And Lord, we just thank You and praise You that we have such a King. A King who can utterly sympathize with us and who has shown us godly perfection in His every response. Lord, we pray that this Advent season You would help us as we seek to become like Him. Lord, help us to be in awe of His majesty and His power. And help us to recognize His absolute divine right to rule over us as our Christmas King. We ask these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.